This is live too, of course, and thanks for joining. We've got lots of people uh, coming on. Uh, I just, um, so you know, I, um, I don't have a lot of slides. Uh, so uh, I do want to leave some time for questions. Last time we did sort of run out of um, time for, for the questions. So hopefully today we can maybe have a bit more of a discussion and really address some of your uh, concerns as well. I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, yes, this is the one here. And now you, you should all be able to see that. Um, and if maybe to somebody can just let me know that you can see the title slide there called virtual learning and isolation. Looks great. Okay, good. So um, that's what we want to talk about today. Just um, what what has been happening specifically with um, with school and um, and and kids just being uh, stuck at home. Uh, I, just if if any of you are here yesterday, we talked about this uh, quite a bit as well. Just around supporting families. Um, we know this this wave after wave after wave of COVID has been hard on teenagers and on kids. Uh, initially, it was just, um, I, I, I talk, talked about this uh, during the TV session on Rogers TV last night, about how at the beginning, it just seemed like it was just an extended holiday, it was an extended March break for kids. You know, they were out at the beginning of March break. I don't know if you remember that, it was like March 18th or something. Um, they, you know, the, the school's finished, uh, March break was out and we already had some rumors that it might be out for two weeks. Um, and um, then it became a month and then it became two months and the extended March break, which was kind of fun for kids and was parents could sort of manage that um, suddenly became much longer and uh, suddenly um, schools needed to scramble. So, oops, I'm just, uh, let's see, why won't it let me advance my slides here? So I'm just gonna, oh, there we go. I don't know why I didn't work there. Okay, so um, sorry about that. So at, at the beginning, it seemed like, okay, you know, I think we can manage this. But as time went on, um, we started to realize that we were gonna be in this for the long haul. And on, honestly, if we, if we had known at the beginning how long it was gonna last, I think it would have been really hard on people. Um, it was almost like, it was good. We sort of, you know, it was like ripping off the bandage slowly, you know, just take just gradually, it just became longer and longer and longer. Um, and uh, if we had known this at the beginning, I think we would have all pulled our hair out. Uh, like how it would have been overwhelming, actually, uh, to think about that. And so in a way, you know, as things unfolded over the course of months to a year, uh, it, it became I think in, in, a, in a way it was a bit of a blessing because it was maybe a bit more bearable. However, you know, fatigue is setting in huge. The desire and the adherence to public health guidelines is becoming more and more difficult as necessary as they are. Because I'll say this again, uh, if, if, if we had not locked down to the extent that we did, we would have seen a destabilized healthcare system, which I'm 100% convinced <clears throat> would have been even worse from a um, health perspective and mental health perspective than uh, the current situation. So those things were necessary. I mean, we, we can't function without a functioning healthcare system, um, but there have been costs. Uh, <coughs> there's no doubt about it. Excuse me, I'm just gonna get a <coughs> the water here. There have been costs, there have been uh, mental health costs and physical health costs, lots of delayed surgeries and, and of course kids being out of school and um, <clears throat> their supports uh, gone uh, or, or at least largely, uh, hugely diminished. Remember the controversy before the pandemic? It was, um, I don't know if you remember, it's, it's hard to remember what life was like before the pandemic. There was two things that I kind of almost laugh about now um, there was the issue, uh, there were some railway blockades going on um, with some protests um, uh, around uh, Indigenous rights and everything. And I remember the talk then was like, wow, this is really going to disrupt the economy. Um, we, <laughs> we had no idea what was happening like months after that. 
uh, with the pandemic shutting down the entire economy virtually. Um, and so many people losing their jobs, unfortunately, and the financial stress and hardship on business and on people. And then that, of course, trickles down to the um, um, uh, mental health uh, of, of so many others as well. And so um, just um, um, how, 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 how much, like how, how, how little we had realized how, 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 how railway blockades were just minor compared to what we eventually uh, were part of. The other issue, uh, I don't know if you recall it, but this was there was a teacher, <clears throat> some action going on from the unions around um, whether e-learning should be introduced more vigorously by the Ministry of Education, which uh, the ministry was actually pushing for more e-learning and uh, teachers were um, quite concerned about that. Um, and again, literally we know that a few months later, e-learning would, would, was going to be everything. Virtual learning was gonna be everything. And, uh, and that, looking back at it now, you know there were uh, there were some there was some action taken um, by um, <clears throat> teachers. Uh, there were some days off, and I know as a parent I was concerned that this action was being taken. Uh, I, I I understood the teachers' concern. I'm not taking sides here at all or <laughs> anything like that. But as a parent, you know it was it, there was concern that these days off of school, these extra days off of school, is going to impact our kids' learning. Um, and again. Um, a month later, our kids were completely out of school because of COVID, and uh, those concerns just seemed so minimal uh, compared to what eventually transpired. So, the the COVID changed schools and schooling dramatically. There were three uh, lockdowns coinciding with three successive waves of the pandemic. There was the initial one from March, which then extended to the end of the school year. Sadly, many kids, you know, missed their graduations. Uh, missed the end of school, they missed class trips, which usually take part at the end of the school year, field trips, uh, seeing their kids, you know, at the same time, all sports leagues and everything were canceled and put on hold. Um, and then there was a bit of a reprieve during the summer and then the fall when things did open up a little bit more, where there was a, sort of a sigh of, of relief, but then things escalated again just prior to Christmas. And I remember, you know, we hummed and hawed about should we get together for Thanksgiving with family. We, we our, my family, we chose not to because of just public health measures. And then we thought, you know, we'll get together for Christmas. And then Christmas, of course, did not happen either. Things actually got worse over Christmas. Things locked down just before Christmas, which necessitated school from staying closed after the Christmas break for uh, until family day in the middle of February. And then schools reopened again only to reclose on the third wave um, uh, after the April uh, break. So the March break, of course, had been moved and we had a weekend in um, April that just got extended to the current day. And uh, right now, most kids are virtual learning. There are um, some kids who are, uh, who are special needs who do uh, have access to the school and are are going still, but that's the very select few kids uh, at this point. So here we are in the third wave and our kids have flip-flopped from virtual to in-person to virtual to in-person. And it's been tough on kids. I saw a teenager this morning who says it's transitions that have just been so hard. Um, and, and she has now developed anxiety and um, uh, has had to be treated for that and, and saw me this morning for the first time. And that's not an unusual story. This is, this is happening every day in my practice, um, kids who are, who are struggling. Um, I'll, I'll also mention, well, I'll mention this later. Uh, the, the platform that the, the kids are using is Google Meet, uh, mostly. Uh, I know there's in different jurisdictions, there's, there are different uh, platforms that are being used. There was a huge learning curve uh, but I'll say most kids have just become quite adept at it at this point. It's kind of like, like Zoom. Uh, it's a virtual classroom. Like if you're not familiar with it, if, you're, if you don't have kids that are in school, um, and then just know that it's kind of like a bunch of squares, like Brady Bunch squares on a screen with all the kids. Um, you know, most kids I find are turning off their camera. Um, and there's sort of a check-in at the beginning. 
there's kind of variable thoughts around whether cameras should stay on or off. I mean, it's nice to know that the kids are engaged, but it is just not really great to be constantly looking at you and to have other kids virtually looking at you. This is hard for some kids, especially some kids who have anxiety and those on the autism spectrum who have difficulty making eye contact at the best of times, uh, this can be distressing and difficult for them. So we need to acknowledge that. Um, I also stress right at the very beginning, uh, parents were just going like, what, what the heck? Like, I, I don't know what to do and uh, what's going on here. And it was a mad scramble at the beginning. Honestly, I think the school boards did their best with what they, what they could do. Uh, teachers, um, you know, worked feverishly to, rec to at least salvage a school year. So there was a late start to virtual learning after last year's March break. Um, and it was, it was like, like trial and error, right? It was, it was like, it was new for everybody. Um, we had not expected to do this and parents had not expected to do this. And a lot of them really became overwhelmed with what they perceived was a need to essentially homeschool their kids. But this is not homeschooling. This was remote learning. And I, I like to make the distinction uh, because I eventually had to tell a, a number of parents like, okay, first of all, you, you didn't sign up for this. You, you, you have a job maybe to go to and other kids to look after. Like this is, you know, give yourself some slack. And really at the end, I was saying, just get through the year and do the best you can. You know, once next school year starts, we'll know that, there, that, that kids won't be exactly at where they should be. And so we'll have to have some grace and some understanding in that. So this was not homeschooling. Homeschooling is actually very different. And some parents, in fact, in fact, chose to withdraw their kids from school and do homeschooling because on homeschooling, you actually get to, to choose your own curriculum and you get to follow your own schedule. And it is not as, uh, in fact, in many ways, probably is better if it, if it could have been managed because um, you, know, you, could, you kind of move at your own pace on your own schedule and it seems it's much more flexible um, and then, then uh, remote learning turned out to be. But for many families, of course, that's not feasible because you, know, you do need a certain desire and, and, and skill set to be a homeschool teacher. It's not everybody, I think, can do it um, uh, without, without at least some training and some, some preparation. So, um, but many families who have gone that route have been happy with it. Um, but many families, that was not a feasible option. Oops. So the, there's variable statistics coming out now about the effects of remote learning. Um, and it is uh, the problem that we don't have a good set of data is because it's been so different. I mean, many schools in the States have been closed permanently for the past year and are just starting to reopen now. So in that situation, um, it's very different. The school system there is somewhat different as well. At, um, you know, lots more private schools and um, probably a lot more um, um, social economic uh, variation from, from, from school to school than we might see here in Canada. I know there are, there's of course variation here as well, but I think that's more pronounced in the States. And so we saw a disproportionate effect on various um, uh, groups of kids, um, uh, definitely um, my, uh, racial minorities uh, were um, worse affected uh, by the lockdowns. There was uh, tend to be less access to digital technology and um, um, uh, Wi-Fi and signals. So um, definitely those students are gonna fall behind more. And in a way, this has widened a, uh, a gap that already existed even further. And that's gonna be a problem uh, because some of these kids will be permanently disengaged from school and it'll be hard to get them back. I, I, I know this is, this is probably gonna be a problem here in Canada too, but maybe to a more of an extent in, um, in, in the States and in other jurisdictions around the world. So we've got a whole generation of kids that have had this huge impact on their development, on their social development and their cognitive development. Interestingly, some kids have done better. Uh, and this was my big surprise in April of last year as, I, as, this, as this lockdown kind of, this first lockdown uh, wore on, um, that I was getting reports from parents going like, oh no, he, he's doing great uh, or she's, 
actually doing well. I feel she seems to enjoy the online learning and uh, um, we're, we're not, you know, we used to be on ADHD medication. We don't need them anymore. And this is, this is kind of a, kind of a surprise. And it, and it turns out that probably the population of kids that I was seeing was maybe a bit biased towards those that, you know, for whom school was a stressor. And that's probably why I was seeing them in the first place. And um, ha removing that stressor actually tended to be helpful. Um, remember at the beginning, I, as I said, it was more of an extended March break. So it was like it's holidays in a way. Kids were sleeping in. Uh, there wasn't much pressure at all. That, that did increase as time goes on, it went on. But for some kids, that, those decreased expectation and more self-direction was actually a benefit. Um, you know, there were also fewer distractions at home. There, there wasn't all the other activities. The schedules were really empty. And so um, uh, some parents were home more and, and some kids enjoyed that as well. And, and they found home less overwhelming than class. Um, also, if there was real difficulty with bullying or other peers uh, and, or just, you know, the classroom was overwhelming for other reasons, that was removed as well. And so some kids found being home in a quieter place um, without really having to worry about managing, you know, the friends and the drama and stuff, that was actually uh, helpful, at least in the short term. Um, also, kids got more sleep. It, it, this, is, this is just a known fact. Sleep cycles were definitely disrupted by, by COVID. Uh, kids tend to go to bed later, but they got up later. There was no more need to catch a bus. Um, I, I mentioned yesterday too, my kids literally just got used to, you know, getting up, um, brushing their teeth and having some breakfast and then turning the computer on. And so what was normally sort of a one and a half hour morning routine became a 10 minute morning routine. <laughs> So um, it's different, of course, with smaller kids. And I can only speak from the experience. My kids are between the ages of 12 and 16 right now. So they're definitely much more independent. And I think, of course, with younger kids, the amount of parental involvement would be much more significant. I was there. I, I know what it was like when the kids were younger. And it is more of a struggle. Um, so what are the difficulties with remote learning? Um, there are plenty of difficulties that we've identified now. Distractions is a huge one. Uh, we already know that kids, uh, I can tell in high school for sure, with cell phones and everything, very distracting environment. Um, you know, friends is great. I love social learning and being in social environments. When we learn, we learn from each other. We learn to be with each other. But friends can also be a distraction. Um, and but at home, of course, that distraction is gone. And it's been replaced by technology, by other things going on at home, by siblings, you know, sitting next to you, younger siblings, maybe not in school who are wanting your attention. So um, many, uh, in fact, many high school kids sort of got seconded into uh, becoming um, babysitters for their younger siblings if parents had to go to work. And this was a huge problem towards the end of last school year, and maybe even this current school year. I haven't heard as much about it this time, but, you know, um, high school students were not able to, to do their high school because they were looking after their younger siblings um, at home. And this, this is, just shows you the, 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 the trickle down effects. I mean, some, some families, I mean, fam parents had to go to work. Uh, and they, they were essential workers or they were frontline workers or they, they couldn't work from home. Uh, for many families, that was not an option. So um, the older kids had to step in to look after younger siblings. Technical issues, Wi-Fi, um, hardware. I know for, for my kids too, I got, like I said, I got four kids. They're all at home. Um, Wi-Fi is a challenge. We, we are, we're relatively, you know, we're not out far outside of Aurelia, but we're far enough that we don't have high-speed internet directly to our home. We're, we, we're off a Wi-Fi, a router, um, a wireless router, a rocket hub. And, um, you know, four kids on at the same time doing like a Zoom-like call was challenging. So um, our, our, for us, you know, our internet costs have gone up dramatically um, with the onset of COVID and we've just had to sort of absorb that. Um, and then so, but, but and then even having the number of laptops, you know, we didn't have four laptops or, or four iPads. Uh, we had a desktop and a laptop and one of our kids had an iPad, but you, the other kids can't do it on their phones. Uh, that would have been really tough. 
So we actually had to borrow some laptops from school and that all had to be worked out and arranged. But some, some families, of course, would have less access to uh, technology. Um, the other thing that is difficult with remote learning is it's just tougher online to provide support, you know, for families to, su to provide uh, support and also hard for parents to be able to support. Like I said, we, we sometimes don't know exactly what needs to happen. Um, you know, many kids have IEPs, Individualized Education Plans, that outlines what sort of help should be provided for, um, for the kids in the classroom. But it's hard to do that virtually. Um, and it's hard to have more sort of customized uh, curricula um, uh, when you're all on a Zoom screen. So that, that has been a challenge that school boards and teachers have had to work through. Engagement, uh, especially with younger students, they, they, they find it hard. I know they love their screen time, but you know, school screen time is different from you know, playing Minecraft. Um, and again, we said last time too that, or I, I don't know, maybe it wasn't last yesterday, but you know, uh, kids can get sucked into video games because they're fast moving and rapid action and lots of dopamine hits to kind of keep them motivated. Uh, teachers can, they, you can't compete with that live. Uh, there's, there's no way. Um, so it's been harder to engage students uh, online. Uh, hard to engage students with special needs. Um, you know, uh, even when I do my telemedicine visits, my virtual medicine visits, I have lots of kids that don't want to be on the screen. They hide. Um, you know, we do the best we can. Uh, sometimes we turn cameras off and we just go with audio and, and maybe that, that helps them to engage a bit more, but it, it is tough. Um, and then of course, the lack of socializing. So the kids are at home, they're not around other kids. And that is usually uh, detrimental. Um, for some kids, like I said earlier, that that was maybe a good thing, especially if peers were a negative influence and it was stressful and anxiety provoking due to social anxiety. But for many kids, they need to be around other kids, especially the older kids, the high school kids, well, the younger kids too. I mean, all, all kids just love being around other kids at recess time. Um, and again, lack of outdoor time. So I know that eventually, you know, we, we learned that outdoors are actually relatively safe. I, I know I put out a little social media post saying that schools are closed, but the outdoors is not. And so I urged families to get outside more, to spend time outside. And as the weather got better, that became more of an option. But remember, it was middle of winter, you know, uh, when this all happened, or sort of at least towards the end of the winter. And then the, the second lockdown was in the middle of winter. Um, so getting outdoors was just more difficult without sort of structured recess time built into a kid's day. And then, you know, this was just one more screen time. This was just one more um, screen um, experience that kids were having in their day. So screen time was already a problem before COVID. And now it was, you know, it was needed for school as well. Now I do distinguish, of course, between screen time for school versus screen time for Minecraft or TikTok. Um, there's what I call digital candy, which is, you know, all the entertainment and Netflix and YouTube and Minecraft and or whatever. And then there's digital vegetables, which is, you know, you know, uh, the, the online learning and maybe work that we do that's necessary and that we need to be on screens for. Um, but, you know, there is still a lot of concerns about bright lights being in the kids' faces all the time, you know, being close to a screen. We've now had reports that there are more eye problems with kids becoming more nearsighted uh, than they were in the past and the increased need for prescriptions for kids for glasses. Um, because of the excessive screen time that they're doing and hunched close to a screen all day long. I know for me, like it's fatiguing when I see kid after kid online for their appointments, uh, it's, it's almost more draining than having at least, a, you know, getting up every once in a while, meeting with patients in a waiting room, walking with them. That interaction is, is actually much less draining in the end than just sitting in my chair all day long and just hitting on off uh, to go from one appointment to the next. I've had entire days where I've just sat in my chair literally all day. And so I purposely and intentionally have to build in some movement to um, stay sane. And, and kids need to do that too. And we, I don't think we really realize that uh, as much as we should have at the beginning. I also wanna recognize just how hard this has been on teachers. I mean, I don't know how 
they they did it. And my hat goes off to so many excellent teachers that have just taken this on and, and made the best of a, a, a terrible situation of COVID. They didn't sign up to be teachers like this either. You know, they love to be with kids. And every teacher I've talked to has, has wished that schools could be back on in person. Um, I, I mean, maybe there are a few out there who like virtual teaching, um, but the majority that I meet and talk to are like, no, we want to be back in schools. We want to be with the kids. And you saw like, you know, schools were last to close. Teachers were, did a great job wearing PPE and face shields. Um, I, I've, I've, I've had lots of Zoom meetings with, with teachers in full PPE just to, just to be in the classroom and to, to do that for the kids. So hats off to them. You know, teachers are at higher risk for COVID illness more so than the kids are. And, and it's more severe in adults. We know that in younger, and sorry, older adults even more. So really, you know, they were in a higher risk situation for contracting COVID than the students were, and they did it for our students. And so, you know, they really were frontline workers and I'm glad that they have access to vaccines um, now. Uh, I wish it would have been sooner, um, but um, kudos to them. Anxiety in teachers went up from 5% to 25%. According to some reports, I, I don't know, it's probably even higher because I think anxiety in general population just who has not been anxious with COVID? Like, honestly, I think I have been. I, I, I think, you know, we all will need to recover to some extent from, from COVID, but it definitely hit teachers hard and uh, um, increased reports of mental health concerns amongst teachers as well. Huge adaptation to a whole new way of teaching, very suddenly with, with little preparation time. Um, and, and I honestly think they did the best that they could with what was given to them. Um, uh, and lack of social interaction, even with in-person teaching, you know, being more or less socially distanced, having the PPE on, I mean, it's not the same having a conversation with a kid, you know, you touching them and, 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 and giving them a hug or, 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 you know, helping them out at close range has, has just been extremely difficult, if not impossible for teachers. And oftentimes they're teaching from home uh, with kids of their own in the background. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it has been hard. So in terms of what, well, what do we do about this? You know, are there any solutions that we can put in place? And um, I think we've, we've learned as time has gone on. Um, things are probably smoother now than they, well, they're, for sure they're smoother now than they were at the beginning. I, I know my kids, for example, have gotten used to logging on, I don't, we don't even have to help them anymore. And you know, they know how to use the technology. Maybe that's in fact one of the benefits of what has happened here. Kids have become quite adept at, at meeting online uh, with, with fellow students. And that's a skill they're probably gonna take into adulthood in a very useful way. But you know, it's important that um, we do try to mitigate some of the difficulties that have transpired. So you know, we need to make a uh, time for the one-on-one -on -one teacher check-ins with the students uh, because that's very hard to do in a Zoom-like setting. Um, so that needs to be incorporated frequently so that kids still do get that, that customized attention. And to do that, you know, we may have to hire more students, uh, more teachers. <laughs> we shouldn't hire students, but we should, may, we may need to hire more, um, more teachers and more staff and maybe more EAs and other workers that can you know, purposely and intentionally check in with those kids online to make sure they're, they're connected, make sure that they are getting the extra help they need if, if that's part of their individualized education plans, that they're accessing the curriculum, that their questions are being answered. Many kids are nervous about speaking up online, you know, putting up their hand. I noticed from meetings too, be, it's harder to engage people in an online Zoom meeting than it is in a room. People are much more ready to speak out if they can sort of read the room and see others around them and, and, and be in that sort of an environment. So it's the same thing for students. Um, managing our expectations. This was very important at the beginning. Like I said earlier, I, at some point I said, listen, just get through this year. Let's, uh, you know, if it need, means, you know, taking a day off to, for mental health reasons or shortening the school day or, um, you know, just and not doing all the assignments, Talk to the teacher, I tell parents, you know, talk to the teachers, let them know 
And, and we just got to manage our expectations for our own sanity and mental health. I mean, in the end, yeah, there's lost education here, but most kids will, you know, they'll recover that over time. It will take effort and time, but, you know, we don't want kids to, to become totally disengaged from school because they just can't keep up. And for parents as well to be, you know, um, that affected by their kids schooling and stressed out about it. Um, make sure that tech is readily available. Again, this is a hurdle that I think we've, you know, I, I like to think we've, we've addressed here uh, locally at least. Um, as I mentioned, when schools locked down, uh, and there were laptops available um, to be picked up for, for students. Um, Wi-Fi, I'm sure, is an option in many places. So again, that's, that is um, going to need to be uh, addressed on an ongoing basis. I know governments haven't said that this is going to be improved, but that's a years long thing. That's not gonna happen overnight. Um, you know, do, do think about changing it up. Um, if, if, you're, if our kids are online now, um, you know, maybe we, it's good to occasionally just get off Zoom and just get a paper assignment and work on that for a day and, and work off a of paper and work asynchronously so that, you know, it's not like on the more rigid schedule of the Zoom meeting um, so many teachers now, especially high school teachers, they get on initially and then they let students do their own work on their own time, sort of more a bit like a homework time. So, um, so that's, um, that, those, those are just some ways to sort of switch it up a little bit, right? So it's not so monotonous and not so the same uh, every, um, every day after day. And then scheduling and breaks. It's so important for kids to take Zoom breaks. Um, and, and these uh, many teachers are cognizant of scheduling those in and, and getting kids, you know, off their seats or getting a snack and then coming back and, and reconnecting. So those are just some 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 practical ways that I, I think we can introduce some some improvements to um, to teaching. And, and and we're learning as we go along. And um, I know that online teaching is going to be available in the fall. This, the government has already, has already announced that. So there will be a cohort of kids who will continue with online learning. And my hope is that that will continue to be a, an, an improved process for, for the kids. Okay, um, isolation. So let's just talk about that as well. So there's the school part. Um, but you know, outside of school, when school is done, I mean, a lot of kids has really been been isolated. Um, I know that people have adhered as 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 much as possible to guidelines, um, but it's tough. You know, not being able to get together with someone outside your household, which have been the most severe measure we've introduced here locally and regionally. Um, you know, that means kids couldn't see their friends. And, um, you know, I know that there were some bubbles that have formed that have been maintained, you know, officially not within guidelines, but, you know, for mental health reasons, um, some families have opted to do that. But for small families, especially when there aren't siblings for the kids to play with, that's been tough on kids to have such little exposure to other kids their age. Um, the, um, um, and, and then hardest on teens because they're more likely to be left alone, right? If, they're, if you're younger, then um, it is, uh, you know, more like that a parent is around or that another older sibling is around. But if you're like the only 13 year old and you have no siblings or 14 year old, your parents have to work. I mean, you're just kind of stuck at home by yourself. And that can lead to depression and anxiety very, very easily. Um, loneliness, it was a problem even before COVID and it's now been exacerbated by COVID. Uh, before COVID, you know, we, we, we saw um, a lot of parents were becoming, well, not, not this, is, this was the reason for loneliness. I'm not saying this was widespread, but, you know, it, it sometimes uh, parents were overprotective and, you know, wouldn't let the kids um, uh, take too many risks or, or do things on their own. Um, and so that, that avoided social interactions. Uh, technology and social media uh, was also a huge factor in kids being more withdrawn, spending more time in their rooms and having really a lot of less meaningful interactions on social media than they would have face to face. Um, and then, of course, COVID exacerbated that with uh, lockdowns, remote learning and, um, and distancing being required um, by public health. So... 
here it just stresses again how important it is to get kids to keep kids connected and in fact this is you know there's been a mixed blessing with social media it's either you know um it it, it is it has its pitfalls and downsides but i often wonder you know 20 or 30 years ago what would COVID have been like without social media and without the technology that we have now um, I think school would have been all sort of paper-based pick up your assignments and work from it at home and and um, um, and, and of course um, uh, there wouldn't have been any social media you would have just had phone calls uh, and phone calls was was fine in those days but certainly being able to connect with people anywhere in the world at your fingertips is a real uh, has been a real blessing as well for so many people including the teenagers and younger kids um, you know we had grandparents who were isolated in long-term care and um, there was also um, uh, they were also able to connect with their grandkids in ways that you know wouldn't have been possible otherwise so ipads have had their blessing in this situation but it's important of course that we do monitor that because there is you know there are the downsides to being overly connected in social media. Like I said earlier, the, those interactions are not the same as face-to-face, -face, but they're better than nothing uh, in most cases. Um, but it's good for our parent, as, as parents to be aware of like what platforms are our kids on, who are they actually connecting with. So I think as parents, we should have access to our kids' devices. I think there's nothing wrong with knowing your kids' passwords and maybe just being with them. Uh, I encourage kids to use their devices in open areas of the house as opposed to in their bedrooms. So um, that's sort of some screen time advice that I give to all the families. Um, and I have been more lenient, you know, especially um, sometimes even in the evenings uh, when, when kids were locked down with their families at home, their, their sort of private time and need for independence was, was really minimize and dismissed um, and we just need to recognize that that's a developmental stage that a lot of teenagers go through and it's probably okay for us just to kind of let them kind of be on their own um, and I know I'm going kind of backpedaling a bit on what I just said like five minutes ago but you know I guess give yourself some grace and just take it on a case-by-case -case basis that, that sometimes our, our teenagers kind of do need to be on their own doing stuff and, um, and having a bit of privacy and having a bit of extra screen time if they're having some meaningful uh, text conversation with a with a friend who might also be uh, reaching out to them for some support so i guess i'm just saying you know there's two sides to the coin here um don't be too strict about one side or the other uh, but just be aware of what's going on and if social media and screens are being used for positive reasons then um, um you know maybe allow a bit more of that um, and then, you know, work on other intentional connections. Um, and this is, this is true in general. And as we move forward through COVID, out of COVID, just make sure that you have a team around your child. You know, there, there, there are good, responsible adults who would love to build into your child. We, we as, as, you know, my wife and I, we have um, a few great adults who are, are leaders at church or at coaches at, on at sports teams. Um, who have, you know, our, our past babysitters have still maintained contact with our kids and have come over sometimes and taken our kids out. And we know they're good influence on them. We know that they will speak some positive things into their life to sort of balance maybe some of the stuff they're getting at school from their peers. And so building a team around your kids is just so important if you can do it. Um, and extended family, you know, utilize them as well. So lots of options for that. Um, move outside like you know isolation generally happens indoors and if we can get outside and sort of reconnect with nature um, that's that's very helpful um, even in our current situations once you know the household bubble is increased a little bit and we can gather more outside you know do it safely if you need to go for a walk outside with a mask on have your kids go outside for for walks with their friends or a bike ride I mean, as the community case numbers go down, these sorts of activities will become safer and safer and just for our mental health sake are gonna be actually recommended. Um, and then, you know, encourage your kids to talk about their feelings. Again, this is a general thing. This is not just during COVID, but having an open conversation, normalizing the discussion around sort of feelings and, and emotions, 
um, is, is great. And just keep that channel of communication open as much as possible. And every moment that your, your child talks to you about like, hey, I'm having a crappy day or I'm having a great day, um, you know, just to have that discussion on a day-to-day -day basis to kind of check in with them and see how their day was. Ask them that every day before they go to bed or at supper time, if you can. Uh, pets is another thing that, you know, sometimes it's really helpful for managing isolation. We know for sure that's the case in the elderly um, um, who live alone. You know, having a pet around can be hugely therapeutic and it can be that for kids too. And as far as we know, pets don't get coronavirus. So um, that they don't have to wear masks and uh, that makes the interaction safe. So I, I guess I'll leave with this, you know, can, can, can this situation that we've gone through in the past year actually make schools better uh, or will this be an opportunity lost? And I think we'll go back to sort of um, a more or less regular school system in September. Uh, we'll probably go back to a semester system, I think. Um, whether schools reopen again this school year is sort of up in the air. I know that it's sort of being discussed on a day-to-day -day basis. My hope is that even if schools can reopen for a short period of time, that they do. I hope we don't just dismiss that, that notion and say, well, it's just a few more weeks, the kids will be fine, because they're not fine. And really having a few more weeks or, or of school at the end, especially for those kids like in grade eight who want to say goodbye to their, to their classmates or grade 12, we just want to, you know, um, ha have an ending uh, of that of that part of their lives um, of going to school, or high school, or grade school would be hugely beneficial. The end of the school is usually, you know, a happy time. You know, we get to finish. It's summertime, um, and if we can somehow recapture that this school year, I think it'd be totally worth it. So my hope is that we can all do our part now. We can continue to roll out vaccines just hang in there for a little bit longer with our, with our um, public health guidelines so that case numbers can drop and we can safely reopen schools, maybe even for the month of June. So I'm hopeful, I have my fingers crossed. I think it'd be great for kids. But moving on to September, you know, what have we learned in COVID that we can take with us into the new school year? When, when this first happened last year, I was like, wow, we could literally like reinvent school. And, um, you know, because, there were, there were problems with sort of the educational system in general that we all knew about, but it's hard to enact change. You know, it, sometimes it takes a massive disruption like this to get the ball rolling. So I'll, um, I'll leave it at that. And uh, as a thought provoking uh, question, hopefully, and, um, and I'll open up to any sort of questions. So much, Rob. Um, I'll let anybody jump in who uh, would like to, but um, if we have uh, a little pause here, I do have some questions that were written in. Um, the first one is, what can parents do to supplement our children's education at this time? Yeah, so um, it, 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 you can get some tutoring, but I would say just be careful with that because, you know, if your kids are already exhausted from doing online school, most tutoring right now would probably be online as well. So you're just adding another online, you know, schooling experience in a way. So uh, it has to be done with, you know, if the child actually wants to and is interested in it, then of course you can pursue that. Um, but I would say probably the best way would be to do more informal learning experiences as a family. I mean, you know, this this be great time to to go to some websites and to check out some you know museums or the science center online uh if you just google sort of online um you know um, learning experiences for kids uh, you'll get a bunch of stuff up that that um are all these sort of exhibitions or um uh, programs that can be done as a family uh, that maybe you wouldn't wouldn't do otherwise. You can sort of do some virtual traveling, etc. So um, having uh, kind of exploring as a family is probably the best way to sort of supplement what your kids are doing. There's lots to be done in an experiential way. Um, but I, I would say um, just be careful about doing anything like really formal with your kids at this time, because in general, kids are kids are burning out um, as, as, as we all are too. If someone said, okay, you know, hey, could, could you do an extra couple hours of work uh, in the evenings? I'd say, no, 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 I, I need some time off. 
So uh, I think kids are feeling the same way. So I would say, don't worry about it too much. Also think about it that all kids are going to need to catch up to some extent. And teachers, I'm, I'm certain, will be uh, understanding if some kids have fallen behind more than other kids and may need some, some help catching up next school year. Um, and I know uh, the government has committed more resources towards kids catching up from some of the lost education that uh, happened this past school year. So I'd say do, do some fun stuff, do some informal stuff uh, this summer, you know, maybe do some traveling that includes some educational experiences uh, if, if possible, um, even locally. Um, but I would, but I would, I would try, to, try to limit the, the more formal uh, routes. Great, thank you. Uh, does anybody have a question before I ask another one from the chat? Okay, so the next one is, my daughter is doing well in school, but as a competitive athlete, the loss of sports is devastating for her. Do you have any recommendations for supporting our children through the loss of extracurricular activities? Uh, yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm in the same boat. Uh, my kids are, they love sports. Um, they, they were on the various teams at school, gone last year. There was no more track and field. Everything from March on was gone. Um, there was a bit of, you know, sports reintroduced in the summertime as much as we could safely. And kids, some kids took advantage of that. But then once school started, there was no sports. There was not even outside stuff. Like I didn't hope maybe cross country skiing would have been an option, but it wasn't. So, um, and now again, you know, there's no, there's no cross country, there's no track and field, uh, really even the outdoor sports, indoor sports were all canceled. I, I can, I feel, I feel the, the, the pain of the person that asked that question. Um, the only way to really do it is to, um, you know, once, once sports reopen for sure, get connected again. And many sports teams I know are just raring to go uh, and do something. But otherwise, it's primarily just doing uh, individual uh, workouts if, you know, for physical exercise. Um, I, I'll tell you, like, what we've done is we've, you know, we, our family, we have a family friend who does CrossFit. And so she has agreed to just send our kids uh, a little CrossFit workout that they can do um, at, at their own time. And our kids have loved it. You know, every, uh, a couple of times a week, they, they, they get the, the, the workout sent to their, their phones and, and they do it and they kind of challenge each other a bit. Um, you know, kids are ca counting their steps. Um, as, as a family, we, we've, we've done more uh, physical activity. We've, we've, last summer especially, we did a lot of family bike rides. Um, our, uh, we had a crazy idea once that we would walk a marathon. And one day we all set out at 10 o'clock in the morning and we actually walked to the 42 kilometers of a marathon. I surprised my kids could do it, but it was a great bonding experience. Maybe don't start out with a marathon. It was exhausting too, but maybe just do like a 10K walk or set, set, some, set some goal that is actually you know, lofty uh, that you would maybe otherwise do um, and, uh, and do it with your kids. So there, there are lots of things you can do individually. Unfortunately, team sports will have to, you know, be limited uh, until it's safe to do so. But, you know, get your kids signed up for anything now in case they do run uh, over the summer. We had a great suggestion from uh, Nikki as well um, in the chat. Um, she was talking about some of the individual sports that um, people could take advantage of. Actually, Nikki, I would see quite often this winter at uh, uh, cross-country skiing at Mountain View, but um, Hardwood Hills has mountain biking and uh, there's some great individual sports. Um, even this weekend, if you are participating in the um, Get Your Mental Health in Motion event, uh, <laughs> Continuing kayaking, uh, lots of individual <laughs> requests for a suitor over here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so lots of uh, good individual sports. So Nikki, thanks for for that suggestion. Um, she also mentions the Strava app to um, you know give some yeah. other goal setting yeah. options. Yeah. Yep. Oh, well, I see a good. comment here about karate as well. Zoom yeah. karate. <laughs> Oh, great, great. Well, those are great suggestions. Thanks, everybody, for chiming in. Yeah, I'm on Strava. I use Strava all the time. It's a great sort of biking, but also many, many sports are on there, so you can keep track and just kind of personally challenge yourself. And yeah, it was. I, I was glad that Mount St. Louis was open for you know a little bit of time, so kids could go skiing. So, you know, there were there were some options, but it was limited for sure. 
but yeah, get inventive, get creative and, you know, challenge, challenge your kids, maybe something that you had wouldn't normally do. So uh, those are great suggestions. Thanks everybody. All right. I also have a question about, do you feel that kids should be required to get the COVID vaccine when it's available for them before returning to in-class learning? Um, well, I'm not sure if there'll be a requirement from school. I, I, I tend to think it's not going to be mandatory, but um, I am very excited about the vaccine rolling out to the lower age groups. I was already quite sure that Pfizer would have, was going to be safe for the younger kids, if, you know, for 15 and under. So it's now been approved for 12 to 15. Uh, we know the Pfizer vaccine was remarkably um, safe and effective. Um, for uh, adults, uh, you know, 16 and over, uh, Moderna for 18 and over. And, you know, I saw no biological reason why it wouldn't be effective for adolescents and probably will be equally effective for the five to 12 year age group that they're testing now. So um, I, I, I do hope that many families take advantage of that. I will definitely um, 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 have you know, my kids will get, will be offered the vaccine. And so um, I have no concerns about that whatsoever uh, once they become eligible and once vaccine supply allows. And I think, honestly, I heard yesterday that they expect that anybody who wants a vaccine 12 and over before the end of July would, should be able to get one. Uh, so be before the end of June. So in the next two months, you know, anybody who wants a vaccine 12 and over should have access to one. So uh, my kids will be in that lineup, and I, I, I hope many other kids will be as well, because the more kids are vaccinated, the safer schools are going to be, along with teachers being vaccinated. You know, this is, this is going to be so helpful in having things sort of return to some sense of normalcy. So um, I don't think it's going to be mandatory, but I certainly hope that there's good uptake uh, on it, even for being able to run summer camps, for example. You know, um, they may have more ability to make it mandatory for their counselors and staff than uh, because they're working in congregate settings um, and maybe more remotely as well. So there might be more of an impetus to have a mandatory vaccinations for camp staff. I haven't talked to camp directors recently, but I'm, I think that conversation must be happening. Uh, but even for as many of the campers as possible that would qualify by the time you know those things start, um, for them to be vaccinated. My, my, one of my kids too is going to be working at, uh, you know, a fast food place this summer and just gonna be lots of people and lots of interactions. And uh, I'm glad that she's able to get the vaccine to, uh, to keep her safe and uh, protected as much as possible from those um, interactions. Even if there are guidelines in place with masks and everything, it still adds a whole other layer of protection. I hope that answered the question. I wasn't sure exactly if I answered the whole question there, but. Um. No, I think that's good. I think you were pretty clear about not necessarily <laughs> thinking that this will be a mandatory thing, but I think certainly uh, giving people a bit more insight into the vaccine and the decision even you'll make within your own family is great. So thank you. Um, does anybody else have a question before we wrap up here? I uh, just don't want to keep uh, Dr. Media any uh, longer than one o'clock because he has patients to see today as well. And he's done, as I said, three sessions for us this week. So uh, we are very thankful for that. Oh, I have one message down here. Oh, <laughs> more of just chatting in the uh, in the chat. So why now, don't we... the, uh, and this is um, uh, son, and she got the yellow belts on Zoom karate. That's so awesome. I care. I want to get my yellow belt. <laughs> that sounds like fun. Didn't know I could do that. All right. Well, if there's no more questions. Um, Rob, thank you so much again. I know you've dedicated a lot of time to us this week, and um, I think a lot of parents and grandparents and uh, kids needed some extra support, especially at this time. So thank you for everything you're doing clinically and here uh, at Waypoint. So thank you very much. Um, if you guys didn't get a chance to check out Rob's session yesterday or the Our Health series talk last night, um, both of those will be available online. All of our sessions will be recorded and available on the Waypoint uh, YouTube channel. So please check those out. Thank you to Mark and Carol Cruden for sponsoring today's session, to all the sponsors who've made this whole week possible. Um, tonight we have Giant's Tomb at seven o'clock. So if you want some music with dinner tonight, uh, great way to end uh, a Friday. Um, if you haven't had a chance, tomorrow is the Choose Your Own Adventure fundraiser for Get Your Mental Health in Motion. So get out with your families, your bubble, and um, canoe, kayak, run, 
uh, walk your dog, play in the backyard, play spike ball, whatever you're going to do. Um, just get out and be active with your family. All of the proceeds are going to support the child and youth family waiting room at the new community health hub. So uh, we certainly encourage you to participate and just do something fun outside to support your own mental well-being and the mental well-being of your families. Um, so again, Rob, thank you so much and have a great Friday afternoon. Yep. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody, and stay safe and Hopefully schools will, will get started soon again. Take care. Thanks so much, everyone.